Conspiracy theories are most often a smokescreen to divert us from the true evil. My dad was right. This family's money is dirty. Imagination is far more fascinating than reality. Welcome to Working for Uncle Henry, the podcast. I'm the series author and your host, Angela Mullins. Chapter 6. Some, those less inclined to reading, might say the centerpiece of the Archer Library was not the enormous book collection, but the massive fireplace in the center of the right side wall. Samuel Archer had the magnificently carved mantle shipped from Europe after World War II. Two deep purple velvet Chesterfield sofas perpendicularly flanked the fireplace. Henry commonly spent his mornings here after breakfast engrossed in his favorite pastime, but that would not be the case this morning. Gerard entered and cleared his throat. Henry glanced up from his book. A visitor, sir. Gate nine, the butler whispered. Gate nine was their code for the secret room in the cellar. Henry grunted at the ill-timed interruption. It was New Year's Eve. Couldn't they leave him alone long enough to get through the holidays? He plopped the half-finished Plato's Republic on the coffee table and marched around to the elevator. Once the door closed, he precisely pressed his thumb on the level one button while staring directly into the hidden retinal scanner above the button panel. Seconds later, he stepped into the cool cellar where two straight chairs faced each other in the middle of the concrete floor. LED lights across the ceiling turned on automatically at the first detection of Henry's presence. Along two of the walls, various colored lights flickered from the racks of mainframe hard drives and other computing equipment, steadily gathering information and running calculations. A section of the back wall opened, the final destination of a tunnel that had been drilled through the hillside on the northern border of the property some years before, all part of an arrangement Henry had made just before his retirement from the Air Force. The tunnel connected a series of caves and delved under the Archer property right up to the cellar. A middle-aged man in a dark suit stepped through the open wall. Henry's government contact normally visited at Henry's request. A visit the other way around was highly unusual. Colonel, he said with a nod. He spoke with an air of authority but also respectful subordination to Colonel Henry Archer. Henry grunted. To what do I owe the pleasure, Carlisle? he grumbled. It's New Year's Eve, for Christ's sake. You know what a big deal that is around here. He paced in a circle and then looked back at his visitor. And don't tell me something's gone wrong with our plans for tonight. Carlisle straightened up. No, sir, nothing like that. Well, what then? Well, sir, you shot down one of the CIA's drones. The emerging glow in Henry's eyes was the only evidence of a grin hiding underneath his mustache. Yes, I did. The director would like to know why, sir. Uh, It seems the service is having an issue with drones finding their way onto the White House lawn, so I decided to try an experiment. An experiment, sir? Yes. You tell our friends at the service that I've solved their problem. The man waited for more information, and after a few seconds of silence, Henry complied. Proper gunfire is quite effective. Yes, sir. Carlyle suppressed the smile trying to form across his clean-shaven face. That thing wasn't spying on me, was it? The man cleared his throat. No, sir. It was a prototype with your latest suggestions. They were sending it for your review. Henry grunted. Well, I guess we learned two things from that incident. What's that, sir? The darn thing needs to be more discreet, and it might behoove the CIA to warn me before they come flying onto my property. The pieces are over there. Henry nodded toward a black garbage bag in the corner. Finished with the conversation, he turned and headed back to the elevator, but stopped short. Carlisle? Yes, sir? Henry stepped closer and stared him squarely in the eyes. I want my niece and nephew protected at all costs. Yes, sir? No matter what it takes. Carlisle nodded. Part of the beauty of this plan is that they are just regular people. Carlisle's stare questioned the regularness of Jennifer Vincini. I know, Henry responded, but she's a regular celebrity. 
They are both people whose work takes them around the world, and there's nothing suspicious about that or them. Who's going to suspect Jennifer of espionage? And Parker is a total innocent. He knows nothing about being inconspicuous or how to be covert. But doesn't that put him in more danger? He's not an object of suspicion, and it's your job to keep them both out of harm's way. But be careful. They're smarter than you may think, especially Jennifer. We have people close to her, sir. Hmm. What's the latest on her father? Where is he? Brazil. Ah! Blasted nuisance he is. Vivian in her big mouth spouting off in the throes of passion about our father's endeavors during the war. Fortunately, she didn't know much, but Vincent's been traipsing all over Europe ever since looking. I guess he finally read a little history and learned about the German migration to South America. You need to get him out of there. I'm beginning to wonder if we made a mistake letting him live. Shall I correct that mistake? I'll just get him back to Italy. He's easily enticed. Carlyle nodded and slipped back through the wall opening from which he had arrived, carrying the bag of drone remains. At one time, the household staff at the estate consisted of Gerard, a cook, and a maid or two, who all resided on the top floor. Now Gerard was the only live-in, occupying the same small suite on the top floor for the last twenty years. A young girl came in every day to help with most of the cleaning, while Gerard cooked and otherwise ran the household. But today was a special day, featuring the biggest party of the year, Edith's New Year's Eve party. In a matter of hours, the house would be filled with music, laughter, dancing, drinking, eating, and conversation on topics that ran the gamut from art, politics, math, literature, antiquities, science, and various innuendos. Something for everyone. With preparations well in hand, Henry summoned Parker to follow him across the back lawn to the garage, a garage that was bigger than the house Parker grew up in. Roll-up doors were located on each end and five parking slips on each side. The wall behind each slip held shiny stainless steel cabinets containing the keys or fobs for each particular vehicle along with manuals and any special materials or tools it required, all efficiently organized. But the real sight was the vehicles in the slips. Parker's motorcycle sat in the first one and was shoddy in comparison. Next was a Pearl Mercedes, followed by a Black Range Rover, a Black Tesla, a Silver Porsche, and a Silver Aston Martin. The LED lights across the ceiling produced a magical glow around each vehicle. Parker passed by his motorcycle and across the front of the automobiles, taking in each one. You have a Tesla? His eyebrows raised in surprise. Ah, yes. Birthday present from Edith last year. Fine car. He would have been proud. Who? Nikola Tesla. He was a terrible businessman, Henry declared, shaking his head in dismay. Died alone and broke, but a brilliant scientific mind. Until he claimed he fell in love with a pigeon. Parker cut his uncle a questioning look, but Henry continued his ramble without noticing. Probably explains why he was celibate. Some minds are best not reproduced, Henry stressed the point with his index finger and a nod. Let's take it to the shop. Henry removed the charger from the car and returned it to its sleek silver charging box mounted on the wall behind. He retrieved the fob, which resembled a miniature car, a hot wheel without wheels. With one click, the silver door handles popped out on each side of the car. Henry drove into town speedily at times, but understandable considering how quiet and smoothly it rode. The downtown area of rolling rivers covered only a few blocks that encircled a city park steps away from the main municipal building. The essential businesses were all there with a sprinkling of the occasional oddity, like a bowling alley housed on the second floor of the laundromat. The streets were clean and well kept. To most, it appeared to be the perfect little town. To others, it was maybe a little off kilter. East Coast Mercantile was in a quaint three-story building in the heart of downtown. Henry acquired the building and business after his Air Force retirement. The import-export business was intended as a cover. The cliché of it all amused Henry, but he quickly came to enjoy the buying and selling of unique pieces and turned it into a profitable business. 
Henry introduced Parker to the lady who ran the store most days. Fiona Weatherby was best described as an earthy young woman who fortunately possessed enough natural beauty to not suffer from the sparse makeup enhancement she engaged. She flashed Parker a sweet smile. He smiled back, slightly red-faced. Fiona managed the first floor items, collectibles, and antiques like those found in the average antique store. The high-dollar stuff was upstairs. The second floor housed the book repository. It was hard to imagine Henry possessing more books than those at the estate, but here, eight-foot-high shelves lined the front walls and two inside rows. Parker scanned the room in amazement. You must have more books than anybody in the world. I cannot live without books, Henry glowingly replied. Thomas Jefferson, he added, attributing the quote. Most of the shelves were filled, but packed loosely to protect the books. Some shelving were wood, but most were metal. Better for storing rare books, Henry explained. You'll need to wear gloves to handle these. Always leave them loose enough to grab from the sides. Never grab the spine. All the windows in the climate-controlled room were layered with UV filters. A worn, comfy sofa sat in front of a window on the right side of the room, while a desk and chair sat opposite. A table and two chairs were nestled in the middle of the bookshelf area. Desk lamps provided proper lighting for examining the books. Parker's eyes swept the room, taking in his new work environment, a major contrast from the high school, even if he had been the librarian. He smiled with anticipation of the adventures to come. So many books, so much history, the stories they could tell. Henry and Parker took the freight elevator to the third floor, where Henry kept artworks and artifacts of more substantial value than those on the first floor. Most of them were acquired specially for resale and just there temporarily. Henry strode to a table where a small blue and white porcelain teapot sat amidst a great deal of packing material. You see this little jewel? he asked, picking it up with delicate hands. Bought it for twenty dollars at an estate sale a few months ago. You can see it's missing its lid and the handle has been broken and glued back on. He held the teapot out to show Parker. When I had a feeling it turned out to be a rare American John Bartlam. Just sold at auction for almost three quarters of a million. Parker's eyes widened. But he failed to see the teapot specialness. He replied with an unenthusiastic, well, he was far more interested in the books. Parker and Henry returned to find the house transformed from the red, green, and gold of Christmas to New Year's silver, black, and white. Crystal vases held glitter trees and streamers of the theme colors. They had even redecorated the 12-foot Christmas tree in the foyer with the new color scheme. Sterling silver chargers and platters awaited their scrumptious contents being concocted in the kitchen, now occupied by our world-class chef and assistants. The cleaning and decorating crews had come and gone, scheduled to return the next day to clear the aftermath of the party. By late afternoon, aromas with enticing hints of what was to come filled the house. Clinking and clanking mixed with orders authoritatively delivered rang out from the kitchen. Candles were specifically and generously placed throughout the main rooms. They would provide most of the light for the evening and add a golden hue to the silver, black, and white decorations. Disco ball ornaments and glittering snowflake cutouts lay scattered among the candles. A variety of hors d'oeuvres, finger foods, and desserts were precisely arranged in straight, even rows on the numerous platters. Mirrored tiles covering the top of the dining table, which now served as the main buffet, made everything on it larger than life. Everything sparkled, elegance abounded. At exactly seven o'clock, the muted sounds of the band warming up transitioned to fast and slow dance tunes spanning numerous decades. Edith enthusiastically greeted each guest as they arrived, whether or not she knew them. Henry sampled the provisions and unenthusiastically awaited the barrage of annoying requests for his support and involvement in one cause or another, the price one had to pay for being highly intelligent, shrewd, and, of course, wealthy. Upstairs, Parker purposely took his time getting dressed, merely delaying the inevitable. The tux Gerard left for him was a perfect fit, but the bow tie baffled him. He wrapped it around his neck and attempted to create a bow, knowing full well he'd never learned to tie one, never had a reason to. He held the ends out and glanced from one side to the other. How on earth were these weird shapes supposed to become a bow? 
He stopped and just stared into the mirror until a knock at the door interrupted his concentration. I thought I should check to see if you needed any assistance, Gerard astutely stated. Parker frowned and held up the mysterious shaped ends. Gerard pulled one end shorter and looped them around into a perfect bow. Will there be anything else? Tell them I'm sick. Gerard chuckled and left. Parker took a deep breath and resigned himself to the next few hours. To reconcile his introvertedness with joining the crowd downstairs, he avoided the front stairway closest to his room, which would have put him right in the middle of the action. Instead, he made his way around the second floor hallway to the back stairs so he could slip in, preferably unnoticed. He peeked into the kitchen and was almost plowed over by a waiter carrying a platter of smoked salmon over cream broccoli and Brussels sprout leaf cups. The hired help rushed and bustled in every direction from the kitchen like a pot boiling over. After dodging a few others, Parker slipped through the back entrance of the dining room past the back stairway. He scanned the room for a familiar face, but they were all strangers, and he didn't do well with strangers. He hadn't seen Jennifer all day, and she was nowhere in sight. Neither was Henry or Edith at the moment. One more deep breath, then just plunge right in. Parker's shy introvertedness is straight from my own personality. I don't do well with crowds either and avoid them whenever possible. Parker gets several of his traits from me. I like to joke that the boring parts of Parker's character are from me. There's a little of me in Henry's character as well. After all, I do write his wise anecdotes. And Jennifer? Well, uh, probably not much of me there. At least, nothing I'll admit. Thanks so much for listening. The books this podcast are based on are available on Amazon. Purchasing links are in the show notes. Next on Working for Uncle Henry, the podcast, it's party time.